Welcome to today's edition of Luck at the Cup. Here I am again in the beautiful and historic Keeneland Library. A fitting venue, I think, for my first guest today because he has achieved so much in the sport and he himself has been a history maker. Hall of Fame, seven-time Record Eclipse award-winning rider. Five Breeders' Cup Classics, four Dubai World Cups, over $300 million in prize money. If I were to give him every accolade that he earned through his career, I would take up all the interview time. I simply want to say welcome to my good friend and NBC colleague, Jerry Bailey. Thanks, thanks for Great having me. Great to see you, Jerry. Good to be here. Uh, in many ways, I kind of wish I didn't know you as well as I did. <laughs> I think it would make this a, a lot easier, but I, I was- That's a little off-putting. I, <laughs> I was going through this um, in my mind the last couple of days and, and I was looking at all these incredible achievements and I was thinking, not bad for a guy who self-confessed didn't really want to be a jockey when he was growing up. No, I wanted to play football. I, I grew up in West Texas. Yeah. And the two things you could do in West Texas were play football and be a jockey. Of course, I chose football, you know, originally. And that didn't work out too well. I mean, were you naturally quite sporty, quite athletic? Yeah, oh, I loved all sports. Yeah. I still love all sports. Um, but I just wasn't big enough. I, mean, I was the water boy. And I, I wanted to be part of the, I wanted to be a jock. Funny, it turned out that I became a jockey. We'll come back to that maybe a little bit later. Sure. It's quite an interesting part of your life, that. But. Was there anything to inspire you to be a rider? Was there anything in your family background to inspire you to be a rider? No, not really. I mean, my father was a dentist, um, but he loved horses. We always had horses at the house, and he owned several racehorses. So I would go to the races on weekends, and I'd see these little guys with the bright shirts run around very fast around a racetrack, and I was kind of smitten with it. And then when I saw this four foot ten jockey walk out of the jockey's room with a six foot blonde and get in a <laughs> sports car, I thought, <laughs> this is me. This is what I'm going to do. Truly. Did, did you always have that sort of taste for the nicer things in life? Was that, was uh, that part Aspirations. Of aspirations. And so when did it really start to click into place? When did you have any clue that you had a, a facility for it, a, an ability for it? Well, I won my second race, and I think my third, and I was pretty successful, although early on, although it was a very, very small track, Sunland Park in New Mexico. So it was just a way for me to make some money, and I honestly didn't think it was going to go on forever. I thought I would do it for a year, make some money, and then go to college. Give me a flavor of Sunland Park, New Mexico in 1970, whenever Four. it was. Four. Uh, spaghetti Western, tumbleweeds, a lot of you know dust blowing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a barren place, but it was full of old timers that really knew a lot, that either jockeys especially that either were too heavy to make it at the big time or had made it in the big time. Ray York was there and was one of my teachers. He had won the 60-something 60, 60 derby undecidedly. Uh, so there was a lot of talented people around, trainers and jockeys. They just decided to live in New Mexico. So that's kind of how I learned. What about the community? What was it, what was it like? Uh, it was middle class. Um, a lot of Hispanics. We lived on the border, um, so it was multicultural. Uh, just a simple, I, listen, a simple way of growing up. And the racing fraternity there, quite tight-knit? Uh, pretty much so, because it was all one circuit within about 300 miles, and everybody went up to New Mexico, northern New Mexico, Albuquerque and Santa Fe and Rio Dosa, where quarter horses run. Had the world's richest horse race at the time. And then back to the winter to Sunland Park. So yeah, it was kind of a circuit for everybody. We knew everybody. When did you feel the need to spread your wings? I really didn't. Uh, my father told me, he said, listen, if you want to make a career out of this and you want to make money and be really successful, you need to leave. Because there was no money there. I won five races the first, my first weekend and made $470. There was just no money there. So he wanted me to go and I went to Chicago and then the, through the Midwest and Arkansas and I eventually made my way to the East Coast. And you were still a young guy, still yeah, a boy in many respects. I left at 17. Yeah. I started at 17 and, and took off. How were you with your self-sufficiency. Were you okay away from home? Oh, I could take care of myself, but there was no rules. And for a 17, 18, 19 year old kid, as I went through with no rules, it's a, it's a recipe for disaster. Well, again, I'll, I'll come back to that. Sure. But, but you started to do really very well and you started to sort of get your way to being a, a known, a known rider. Good enough. Mm. I, I don't think I did really well, you know, in my early teen, late teens and early twenties, but I did good enough and I would win enough of important races to where I caught the attention of some important trainers. I think that's about the maximum of it. And you started getting to the big circuits. Yeah, and, and then I rode in Florida, which all the, the major trainers and owners and jockeys would come in the winter. 
And even though I'd go back to Chicago or New Jersey early on, I would winter in Florida. So I, I kind of got to know the big time guys. So at that point, did you think you were doing well or not? Of course I did. In my mind, I was, I, could, I, I, had no ambi I had no ambitions of winning the Kentucky Derby or any of these major races. So yeah, I, I was paying my bills. I was a, a young man with a few dollars in my pocket. Uh, no obligations. So yeah, I thought I was doing great. And you were living what you thought was a, a good life, but that good life, as you've hinted at already a couple yeah. of times, tipped over into a, a life dependent on, on alcohol. Oh, you've, you've spoken yeah. about it very, yeah. very yeah. frankly, and I know it's something yeah. that you believe is a very important part it, of your it, life. It got out of control. Uh, I mean, I didn't realize it at first. Through, through my early 20s, I didn't realize it at all. I, I just thought that was normal because I surrounded myself with people that did the same thing. So, of course, I would think it's normal. Uh, but by my mid-20s, especially when I met my wife-to-be, um, and shortly into our marriage, she pointed out that the, my excesses of drinking weren't really normal. And, and then I became to realize it, and then I just couldn't stop. So there was a period of time where I knew I had a problem, but I just couldn't stop. Because I've, I've known you in the latter part of your your career and, and the broadcasting life, and mm -hmm. I see how methodical and sensible and dedicated you are. I just can't imagine you as someone who was off the rails like that. And I always say to you, was it really that bad? Was it really that bad? It was, but no, not too many people knew, Nick, really. I mean, because I was a very sneaky type drunk. Uh, I wouldn't go out in public and display my drunkenness at all. I would be the guy that would have a, a half a drink or one drink at a social function and then go home and, and drink uh, a fifth of vodka. So yeah, I was, I was under the radar, but nevertheless, it was a big problem. When you got out of bed in the morning, was it the first thing you thought about? Oh, absolutely. When I hit the finish wire, it was the first thing I thought of. Okay, I can shower, get dressed, be at the bar and have a drink in 20 minutes. That's where it took me. And what was your own mind at the time, obviously a little addled, telling you about your own riding ability? Did you still think you were great? I thought it was good. I mean, look, great really never entered my mind. I, I never thought, am I great? Am I not great? I, I was winning races and I thought I was good enough. But, and then there became the time where I knew I had ability, but I would probably never reach it because I couldn't quit drinking. Can you pinpoint a particular occasion that moved you from someone who was drunk most of the time to someone who would spend the rest of their life sober? Oh, sure. Uh, it was New Year's Day in 1989, and my wife came home, and I was completely blacked out. And she said, we need to get you into uh, some treatment. And the funny thing was, at the time, um, all I knew was inpatient stuff. And I said, oh, I'm way too important to go inpatient. If Cherry Bailey is not at the races, you know, for 30 days, what's, what are the headlines going to be? I, I was a legend in my own mind, you know, and truly, um, nobody cares, really, nobody cares. But a friend of mine who was in the uh, Miami-Dade police force had told me about a year earlier, he said, listen, if you ever uh, decide that you need any help with any, you know, drinking or anything, I've got a lot of friends that have drinking problems and I know where to, to send you. And I never thought about what he was telling me. I thought he was talking about his friends when obviously he was talking about me. And so we rang him up and uh, I got into an outpatient program that was scheduled for six weeks and I stayed for three months. And that was it. Uh, that was my last drink in January of 1989. Do you ever reflect on his advice and think that was quite a clever way of putting you on the right track? Oh, sure, sure. I mean, um, at, at, like I said, at the time, yeah. I thought he was talking about his friends. I didn't think he was talking about me. But yeah, that was great. It was great that he reached out and planted the seed. Exactly, yeah. rather, rather than bullying you and yeah, saying, oh, yeah, Jerry, yeah. you're drinking too much. You Look, to if you don't want to quit anything, you're not going to quit. When you want to do something, that's the genesis of being able to do it. And did you immediately feel release, relief? Uh, Nick, I immediately felt my relationship with my wife get better. My thinking was clearer, and the success on the track was instantaneous. So those things were black and white to me. So then quickly it became, my life was terrible, full of problems, and it's becoming great. What do I want to do? It was, it was clear to me I was going to keep doing what I was doing, and that was not drink and try and get my life together. And it just got better every day. Because it, it, 
I'm not saying you make it sound straightforward, but a lot of people have been in this predicament and do find it really hard and slip back so quickly. Yeah. Would you, do you think, have gone that same way had it not been for, for Susie? Oh, yeah, I, I do. Um, and, you know, she didn't, there was no threats, really. Uh, it was just support. But uh, I, she, she took me to where I needed to be. And first, I had to get to my bottom. And I was just tired of being beat down and because it was always hiding the booze and hiding it from Susie and hiding it from everybody else. It just became too much. Um, and, and, and then when she helped me get to that place, yeah, totally, totally. She was a, a huge part of this. And so when you moved forward, could you identify a point then subsequently in your career where you did feel like a next level jockey, where you did genuinely feel like things were starting to happen for you? Yeah, so I don't know if there was an aha moment, um, but quickly, I mean, within the first year, uh, because many of my colleagues behaved similarly to what I did. And now I'm very clear headed and I'm riding with many guys that aren't. So you've so, got an edge. Oh, I think I had a huge edge, yeah. And uh, some, not all, obviously, but uh, yeah, I thought I had a huge edge. And pl plus, I was studying better, I was seeing the races, I was anticipating better. I was, my timing was, everything was better. Did you actually enjoy the, the business of the sport more then? To be honest, I enjoyed the success uh, because I was reaching a place where I was getting removed from horses. I was, you know, trainers were taking me off, owners were putting other guys on, and I, and I knew why. Uh, I rode for Rokeby Stables, a huge outfit, and Mac Miller, who was a great friend of mine, the trainer, took me off the entire stable. So that's where it was taking me, and now all of a sudden I was climbing back up the ladder. So yeah, that was great, I loved it. Given that it was Mac Miller who'd taken you off all those horses, how rewarding was it to get on Sea Hero to win the Derby in 94? 93. Three. Yeah, uh, yeah that, was, that was pretty cool. Because uh, even though he had removed me from all the horses, I continued to go by his barn every morning and had coffee with him. So we maintained a friendship. So when I got straightened out and my life and my career started back on the upswing, he slowly started putting me on horses. Uh, and I just thought it was great to be able to ride for him again, uh, not thinking that we were going to end up winning the Kentucky Derby. But yeah, that was, that was really a cool moment. Did he say much to you about sort of getting back in the swing of it, or was it a case of action speaking louder yeah, than words? Yeah, he kind of didn't. Um, he was my, a father figure to me. Um, and. I, it was just actions, and, and the fact that he removed me, first of all, just killed my heart. And then when he started putting me back on, I could see some light at the end of the tunnel, and it was, and it emboldened me. It really did. It inspired me. Was much said between you when you won the Derby? I don't remember. I don't think so. Um, it might have been. I mean, we were just, we were really good friends by that point because we had been through so much together. But I don't remember him saying anything. And was that victory, was it, was it a victory that gave you the impetus one would expect? Did it, get, did it push you forward? It did, but I had already started that because I'd won the Breeders' Cup Classic in 91 and this was 93. Yeah. So the, the momentum had already started, you know, within two years of uh, my initial sobriety. So it, it was just a, a run up. So it was just part of a, a, just a miracle run for me. Well, 93 was a miracle year for our Kong as well. The, <laughs> the, probably the, the most famous Breeders' Cup Classic winner yeah. in many respects for being the longest price and people are familiar with the story of how you never really got any, any instructions. How, how quickly into the race did you think, well, hang on a minute, this is not going to be a total disaster? Uh, halfway down the backside. Uh, I just, in the early part of the race with no instructions and no idea how to ride the horse, I just rode him European style, just dropped him out the back and I went to the rail and and I just didn't want to be embarrassed. You know, I'm straggling home 50 lengths, so I thought I'd give him the best chance to finish up in the race. And then he started taking me through the, through the middle of the race, and I came up behind a horse I believe named Izud. Yes. Yeah, and I watched, I can't remember who was on him, maybe Ettery, but whoever it was, he was patting him on the neck. It could have been, was it Walter Swinburne? Somebody like that. Maybe, maybe yeah. but, um, but he was moving well. He was traveling through the race good. I said, this is a horse I can follow. Because that's what I wanted to do as a rider. I would, I would study the form and study film to see who I could follow through the race when I was on a come from behind horse. Without the form and without any video, I just was trying to find somebody within the body of the race to follow, and he was the horse. So, yeah, I thought as I went through the middle of the race, I had a chance to get a piece. 
and the rest is history. And he, he, he won pretty easily oh, as well. Oh, very easily. Yeah, I, I knew when I turned for home I was going to win. And when I went by Gary Stevens, I knew that he was probably thinking what I would think, like, who in the heck is this horse? You know, because he was on the favorite, I think, Bertrando, and he looked home free, at, at least in the middle of the stretch. Um, what, what were your feelings about Andre Farb after that, <laughs> having known he was a fairly good trainer? Uh, I didn't know a lot about him at the time, but I heard he was a, a tremendously successful uh, trainer from Europe, more specifically France, and I'd never met him. I didn't even meet him in the paddock because I was already on the horse by the time that he was waving good luck to me, but uh, he, did a, he did a great job. And you then became in, in huge demand through the rest of the, the 90s and into, yeah. into the early noughties, yeah. but your, your marquee horse, essentially, your horse of a lifetime, was right in that, in that sweet spot, Cigar. Um, when I've heard you talk about Cigar before, you talk about him like you don't talk about other horses. You talk about him like a personal friend. Yeah, you know, look, it, I didn't love horses when I started riding. Riding was a means to an end. It was an athletic endeavor that I could participate in and I could be a jock. Um, so the, and plus I was drinking, so I, you know, there was no jockey horse relationship. So I, when I quit drinking and then I stumbled on Cigar, that gave me a whole different appreciation for the horse itself. And I started spending more time around the barn because he was there, and he was just a cool horse. And he was very charismatic. Uh, it was appropriate that he was so good because he loved cameras, he loved people. He liked to be in the limelight. Yeah, he was, he was fun to be around. Did you feel you had a connection with him when you got on him, unlike a connection you'd had with other horses? I don't, I don't know. Or is that too much? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not one of those. Julie Crone was the, you know, he gets me this horse and all the lovey, smurfy stuff that she used to do. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if he got me. I just think he was really good, and my style fit him really well. Um, but a hundred riders could have been probably as successful on Cigar as I was. And he had that win streak of, of 16. Do you, in your own yeah. mind, think that that win streak should have been 18? Because he yeah, lost his yeah, last couple of I, races. I, um, look, when you start riding a horse that, at least for me, this is the way I think, when you ride a horse that wins that many in a row, and this, his style was he never got in trouble because he's always in the race and handy. You think they're unbeatable. You think they're bulletproof. And that's how I started beginning to think about Cigar. There was nothing I could not ask this horse to do that he couldn't do. And of course, he had his limits. And, and it started showing up in his second year, you know, after the undefeated season and the travel back and forth, you know, the Dubai and crisscrossing the country. And yeah, I, I asked him to go way too fast in the Pacific Classic so that I wouldn't get him trapped in behind horses, because I thought that was the only way he would ever get beat if I got him boxed in and he couldn't get out. How, how soon could you put that to bed in your mind, or did it, did it linger there? Does it still linger it's there? It's still there. It is still there. Is I mean, it, it doesn't keep me up at night, but um, look, there was two of us out there, and I was the guy guiding him, so I would, should have been the guy that made the right call. And as many as I got right, I got that one wrong. He also transcended the sport a little bit, and not many horses do that. Even Kentucky Derby winners, Breeders' Cup winners, horses have been around for a while. There aren't many that yeah. get off the back pages. Yeah, especially, you know, I, I wouldn't say racing was in its heyday in the mid-90s, but it was extremely mm. popular across the country. And he was one of the few horses that people that don't really follow the sport knew that wasn't in the Kentucky Derby or the Preakness or the Belmont the year before. He didn't run in those races. So he caught people's attention that were fringe fans, even though he didn't run in the Triple Crown. And you could sense that when you went. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look at the crowds. Did it elevate your profile sort of beyond racing? Yeah, I, well, I think I was associated with him, and, and that was a good place to be. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. That relationship with, with Bill Mott was one of sort of three or four really important jockey trainer relationships you had. He's still going strong, still training a bunch of winners. He could train the Breeders' Cup Classic yeah. winner again this year. What is the secret to his sort of sustained success. When you go to the Belmont's barn, you're gonna find him probably either on the pony or most likely in the stall with the horse. He is as hands-on as it gets. He just, I don't, I don't think it's a horse whisperer, but he's in there with him and he lives and breathes the horse. And not to say other ways aren't right, but that's his way and he knows every hair on every horse. The funny thing is, on Cigar, I pulled up some old pictures the other day, and I won a race for Bill Mott uh, back in 1976. No way. Yes. And I got the picture, and I pulled it up, and then I started thinking, and then, then I didn't ride for Bill Mott a long time. I had to go to his barn 
and say, is there any reason you're not riding, for, riding me on some of your horses in 1994? And he said, no, I guess there's no reason. He was riding Mike Smith. So when the opportunity presented itself, he put me on a horse, and that horse was Cigar. That's amazing. You'd ridden yeah. a winner from him in 76. Yes. Phenomenal. Old Thunder is the horse's name. <laughs> How appropriate. And you know what? He wasn't even listed as trainer. He was listed as co-owner. Wow. So there you go. That's where it all started. Uh, if you say that he was an instinct, or is very much an instinctive trainer, someone who just gets it, just gets the horses, how would you characterize Bobby Frankel? Mm. Bobby Frankel was an enigma to me um, because he, 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 was, he was as sensitive to what his horses needed as Mott was, but he didn't do it the same way. Mm -hmm. He wasn't necessarily in the stall all the time, uh, but he had just a, a sense of when to try something different with horses, eat both training, uh, in the morning, strategy in the afternoons, where to run his horses, when to run them. The, the one thing that struck me about Bobby is that he wouldn't waste a great performance on an allowance race. And it might only be the second race of a horse's year, third race of his career, but he knew when a, a brilliant performance was coming and he put him in a stakes race. And your record with him in those four or five years, sort of late 90s into the, into the noughties, were, yeah. was insane. I mean, you were going at like 38, 40% Yeah, I, I kind of didn't realize his reputation about how hard he was to write for, how difficult a guy he was to just have a relationship or maintain uh, writing for him for any length of time at all. But we started out on a great foot. I, I, I had my agent, Ron Anderson, call him to ride a horse called Chester House in the Arnington yeah. Million, which was the first race I remember uh, of consequence riding for him. And the horse won. And um, then it was kind of a run after that for a couple years, three years. Did you, did you sort of realize at the time it would probably be finite because he was quite tricky? You know, I, I didn't. I, I never thought that because I just thought we'd keep winning. <laughs> you know, I thought I was riding well. well. You, you sort of did keep winning. Yeah, and he, was, he, he always had great horses. He didn't make mistakes training. So, you know, what's going to mess this thing up? Uh, I didn't, really didn't think anything would mess it up. So what did mess it up? I don't you know. Um, well, I broke my wrist for one thing, and I, I, I missed uh, a few months on seek, uh, Sight Seek and a couple other horses. Um, and, and then I don't know. I guess I, I kind of retired, I guess. I don't know. It was in that era. I mean, I rode for him up until 04, 05. Mm -hmm. I retired at the beginning of 06. But did you feel he was sort of losing, you were losing that relationship? <sighs> yeah, well, he rode other riders. There was one horse he, um, that I worked him out in the morning. And I came back and Bobby said, how did he go? And he worked really slowly. He didn't work badly, he just worked slowly. Mm -hmm. And I said, God, he was really slow. I think he worked five eights and 106. And he said, ah, he's, he's better with Blinkus. And I said, oh, all right. And so the entries came out about three or four days later and Javier Castellano's on the horse. And I quickly got a racing form and, and looked at the horse and, and he had already won a couple races. The horse was Ghost Sapper. So I went, to Bo I went to him and I said, Bobby, I said, this is the horse I worked. What's going on? He said, ah, don't worry. When he gets beat, I'll put you back on him. Well, he never got beat. No. You know. he was a pretty so that was the horse. first moment I realized I wasn't uh, as solid in with the Frankel stable as I was you know, a year earlier. So is that the point where you started thinking, mm, I might, maybe I've had my, my best years? No, not really. I just thought I might have had my best years with Bobby Frankel. There, there's other guys you can ride for. Could you not have gone on riding for another five, six, seven, ten years? I could have. I don't know that many years, but um, three or four, maybe. I mean, I look at the Frankies and the Mike Smiths. and That wasn't happening, though, when no. I retired. I look, I, approaching my mid-40s, I asked Angel Cordero, uh, because he was the most successful and the best rider I rode with on a daily basis. And I said, Angel, when you're nearing the end, what's the first thing to go? And he said, your business. When your business goes, that's when you go. And my business was still pretty strong. I thought he was going to say your timing or your legs or, you know, something like that. Uh, but my business was still pretty strong. And as a matter of fact, Ron Anderson, my agent, said, dude, we can keep doing this for several more years if you want. But look, look at my, my son was getting through grade school. Uh, I had won just about everything I wanted to win except the Triple Crown. And I could have gone on 100 years and not won that. Um, and financially I was fine, so um, I kind of missed my family. And I just thought it was time. Well, it was an amazing career. 
uh, and one that can't really be replicated in terms of the adrenaline and the buzz and the excitement and the success in any other era. But I don't know, Nick. This, you, this television you, you, stuff, yeah, it's, I, it's, it's pretty fun. <laughs> when that red light goes on, you know, there's a lot of adrenaline there. It's surely fear in a different way, isn't it? But it's fun. It's, 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 it's not the competition in the sense that I had riding, but it's still watching a race from a seat rather than the back of the horse and then trying to relate that to somebody that might want to understand it the way I understand it. And I suppose if there's another parallel, maybe, um, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, it's like the bigger the game, the bigger the day, the more oh, up for it you are. I mean, look at a Kentucky Derby broadcast is a, yep. a sort of thing of wonderment, really, in yeah, terms you've of the, watch, all the moving parts. You've got to watch 20 horses mm. in there and try and not make a mistake. You know, the public's all watching, and, and if they see something you don't, how embarrassing then would that be? So, yeah, there's an edge to that. Well, I know we're going to talk a little bit more yep. a little bit later on, but for the moment, Hall of Fame jockey Jerry Bailey, Thank you very much You're indeed. Welcome, and when you rejoin me right after this break, I will be talking to a woman who's making a serious impression here in the United States, having just won her first grade one race in the Cotillion Stakes at Parks, Sophie Doyle. <laughs> Welcome back, you're watching Luck at the Cup. Jerry Bailey rejoining us toward the end of this episode. But as you can see, I'm joined by Sophie Doyle, fresh from grade one success on Street Ban in the Cantillia Stakes at Parks, her likely mount in this year's Breeders' Cup Distaff. Touch wood, everything goes okay between now and, and Santa Anita. But Sophie, great to see you. How, how does it feel now to be a, a grade one winning rider? Still, I think still walking on cloud nine. It's pretty amazing. It's very special that I finally have achieved it in my career now. And you're a pretty determined customer. I wasn't sure what the answer would be to, did you expect to be riding grade one winners? Yes, I've always thought I would be good enough to be there and I've worked really hard and I've never let anything stop me. I think with the success of my brother and some of the riders that I've been around, that when you put yourself in great company, you should expect great things. And that's what I've always done. I've always believed in myself and I've kept on you know, working for it and hope that one day it will pay, it will pay off and now it has done. We'll talk about your, your brother James, who's a, proven himself an elite level international jockey. He's been incredibly successful in, in Europe and has ridden very well elsewhere too. Were you very competitive as youngsters with each other? Yes, very competitive. I remember one morning that James and I were working two of my mum's horses, Jackie's horses up the gallops. And when we pulled up from the breeze, a trainer called Sylvester Kirk drove up to us and came along and said, well, both of you will be jockeys, but we know who's got the horsemanship. And he pointed at me and I said, well, I'd like, I'm glad that I have both, but the two of us, we were right, riding all the way up to the top of the gallop and it was nice that somebody pulled up and could see that, you know, the competitiveness between the two of us and what sort of qualities we had. So the fact that he he had to graft for it as well. He had to work for it. He went through a little fallow period in his career, but the fact that he was getting right up to the top when you were going through a difficult period, when you were struggling, was that spurring you on? It always has done. Um, I think that I, what was fortunate enough for me was that I met up with Rodney Simpson, who took me to over to Dubai. And it took him six months to convince me that it was somewhere that I needed to go to. And when I did go, I had a great time. Rodney Simpson was fantastic. He taught me so much. And he also, he, it was like he took me out of the nest mm -hmm. and kind of flew away from home for four and a half months. I was out in Abu Dhabi and working in Dubai. And it really helped me to be able to see more of the world and know that there, there is more out there than just where I was at home. So I think it really, you know, when times were a little bit more difficult, I said, well, I, you're not just based in one place. I haven't just got England. There are many other countries that I can go and play, play, play my trade out there. And so I decided to travel and I went to, did my time in Dubai. Then I came out to California and I was there for three months on a working holiday. And then I decided after two holidays out there, this is where I want to be. What was it about riding here in the, in the States that appealed to you? That you weren't getting out of out of riding in the UK. I think there's just so much many so many more opportunities, and I actually really enjoy riding the dirt. Um, I've ridden on the turf my whole career, my whole life in England. That riding on the dirt was just so different, 
and such a change of pace in the races. And, you know, the fact that you, some racetracks have anywhere between 10 to 14 races a day, you know, the light bulb there was, well, there's got to be an opportunity. You know, I won't be just sitting waiting for that Monday racing of um, a bank holiday Monday, as they say, waiting to come around when you have the most days of racing when they need to use all the jockeys that are available in England. So I decided that this was something that I wanted to look into. And once I got a taste of it, I just full steam ahead. That was it. Because mm -hmm. your career in England had started really well, mm -hmm. but it, well, it really had hit the buffers, hadn't it? It did. It did definitely. You know, after my first trip out to America, which I was actually at the time thinking, well, my, my apprenticeship is going so well that I didn't want to ride all my claim out on the old weather during the winter. So that's why I decided to come to America yeah. for three months. I was fortunate enough to get the opportunity to ride two or three races while I was there. So I sort of got a bit of a taste of it. And then when I came back, things just didn't materialize the way I thought it would do. And I said, wow, that was a bit of a shock, but... Did you feel like you were just being dropped? In some ways, yes. It was almost like because I'd been away, well, out of sight, you know, you're out of sight and people just say, oh, well, we didn't know where you'd gone. Even though I'd made it well known, that's where I was. And I was working under the apprenticeship of Jamie Osborne. But when I came back, it just seemed to not be working out. And so I said to myself, so if you're good enough and if you've made your, you made your career in England, you can, you're good enough to start again and make it, you know, make a fresh start, scratch the bottom of the barrel, just work your way to the top. I thought, well, I'm at the bottom. There's only one way to go and that's up. And if, you, if you're willing enough to put the hard work in and be t determined enough, then I just kept believing in myself. And once I made that fresh start, I've never looked back. Who've been your biggest allies? I mean, honestly, my mum, my mum, Jackie, she's always been the driving force behind me. And especially as she's always shown me how to be a fighter and how to never give up and how to always keep working hard. And that's what it's always done for me. That as I've grown older, I can see my, the reflection of my mum in myself now where I've got the drive and I've got the force. And, you know, I'm not, I've used to be this shy little girl that would sit in the pub, in the corner of the pub at home and never talk to anybody. But once I learned to go out there and, you know, see the big wide world by myself, I've really kind of blossomed and like a flower blossomed in the world and I've really enjoyed it. I mean, I can sense that, that being in America has really brought you out of your, your shell, if, if you like. It, 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 it has that effect, I think, on, on that English res reserve, do, do, do you think? I really do think so, because back home, I had traveled all across England I rode at all 56 racetracks that there were back at that time. I know there's a few more new tracks that have come to England since I left. But it tra as I was sort of traveling around and then I went out to Dubai and I met new people, you know, it's been nice to go to a foreign country that you, that when I came here, I didn't know anybody. I knew one trainer that Jamie would send me to Jim Cassidy. And then I just sort of got to know people, branched out, made new connections. When I came back to America, when I finally left England and came here, the only person I knew was like Jim Cassidy, mm -hmm. Sean McCarthy, who actually got me my visa for me, and I was working for him. And then I decided, well, six months after being in California, I need to really, if I'm gonna make a go of this, I need to be in a spot where there's plenty of opportunity. And that's what brought me to Kentucky. And you've done well here. You've done fantastically well in, in, in Chicago as well. Mm -hmm. That's been a, a great, great source of success for you. In terms of the trainers that you've been riding for, obviously Larry Jones, who, who trains Street Band, is a, is a huge fan of yours, but who else has been sort of helping you along the way? I was actually very fortunate enough that Mark Cassie had actually given me a good opportunity and put me on a couple of live horses. And, you know, I ran third in a grade three for him at Churchill. And, and also when Fioretti came on the scene with Anthony Hamilton and Tony Braddock, mm -hmm. They're the ones that sort of, they really gave me a, a great boost and I managed to win three, four stake races on her. And, you know, just the opportunities that are out there of everybody around here, especially race, racing here at Keeneland. I think um, at one spot at the training center, one of the training centers in Paris, I had an agent come up to me one day and said, well, 
I don't know how I'm going to get my jock in here because every barn I walk into, Sophie Dorr's already been in and sewed it all up. So it's like, it's almost like you've got your own training place of connections. I mean, there's lots of people that have really helped me on my way. In terms of riding as a, as a woman here in America, is it uh, more accepted, do you think, than it was in the UK? Uh, more difficult or comparable? I think it was just more comparable that people here just... It just seemed to be so much more easier to get going that when the opportunities came along, people, some people stuck by me mm -hmm. and they gave me the opportunities. And I've always said that back home when the opportunities came, you know, the likes of my brother, Ryan Moore, Richard Hughes at the time, if they wanted your mount, they got it. So it's kind of been, it's been nice of being here and being a bit more in the advantage of like street band right now. I know there's been plenty of top jockeys that have been asking to ride her. And Larry's been fantastic and said, Sophie brought us to the dance and that's where we're staying. That was a brilliant win at, at Parks in the, in the Cotillion and the race panned out just perfectly for you. Do you think that we're underestimating her ability still because she had the run of the race? I think a little bit, yes, because, you know, that day the pace is what helped me win the race. And watching how everybody was setting their race up in front of me, you know, I never, I actually, quite honestly, I never thought I would be at the back of the field as, as far back as I was. But, you know, my agent, Penny, has always said to me, you know, in those big races, just play the break and let the race take you into the race. Don't try and take her out, but don't try and force her to be there. And when the pace just suddenly started to pick up as we're hitting the turn, I said, if I send her, she's going to cook herself with these guys too early and we're not going to have a shot to win. So I just left her relaxed. She started traveling fantastic underneath me. I just, and turning down the backside, I just let her take me through the field. And she just, every horse that she passed, she got more confident and more confident. And then when we hit into the final turn, when she switched to her left, she grabbed the bit. And I said, oh, not yet, not yet. I said, just wait. And, um, and then once we got, you know, I didn't want to lose too much ground as we've had to make up so much ground. Mm -hmm. That when we came around the top turn and we hit into the stretch, I mean, she just really took off. And what I loved about her was that she kept galloping away. She didn't get to the front and, oh, okay, we're done. You know, she kept powering away past the finish line. She galloped out fantastic. And I really, you know, she gave me a fresh sense of how great she can really be. And for you to be headed to the Breeders' Cup in, a, in one of the key Breeders' Cup races with a significant chance, what, what, what does that mean to you? It's huge. I mean, what an amazing opportunity for myself and, you know, to be out there riding with all the top people, you know, riding in a grade one race that is really tough. It's going to be the best three and four year olds or older horses there at the meet. And, you know, I, this is what I've worked for. These are the opportunities that you want to come be and be available in your career as a jockey. And especially as mine's sort of, I've had an up and down the roads and right now this is where we are and hopefully we'll just keep continuing and picking up a, and hopefully find another grade one filly along the way. And Jerry already mentioned uh, Julie Crone earlier in the, in the program was a great pioneer pathfinder for, for female riders I and mean, more recently Rosie Napravnik I know is someone you look up to mm -hmm. enormously and she yeah. she pretty well cracked it. She really did I still remember Rosie when she when she started that she used to have on the back of her pants the girl I mean, that was a long time way back in her career, but I, that's how far back I've been following Rosie. Mm. And she's just been phenomenal. And, you know, it's quite ironic that from what, these are the two races that she won before she retired. And these are the two races that I've won one that hopefully I can go and continue and win the, um, the distaff with Street Band and pick up where she left off. Have you spoken to her about it? Not really. I've spoken to her recently. She called me about um, her media... Kelly uh, Wiseman rang, wanted to ring and be in touch with me and said, look, you know, I represented Rosie. So Rosie rang me and said, look, if you'd like to pick her up and I wish you the best of luck moving forward into the distaff. And, you know, that was really nice to hear from her. So, you know, it's really good. Well, Sophie, for the moment, thank you very much. And Sophie will be rejoining me right after this break and we'll be bringing Jerry Bailey right back on set.
Welcome back, you're watching Luck at the Cup. Delighted to say that uh, Hall of Famer Jerry Bailey and Sophie Doyle, grade one winning rider, are still with me. And it's great to have you both here. And Jerry, I, I, I know it's, it's very nice for you to be properly acquainted with, with <laughs> Sophie and, and to be reminded that her name is in fact Sophie Doyle, not, not as you called her in the NBC <laughs> telecast of the Kentucky so, Oaks. So should we fill the audience? <laughs> I, think we, I think we probably should. All right, so I'm a perfectionist and I hate making mistakes, especially on air. And the, one of the most important moments in her life, more than likely, is the Kentucky Oaks. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I drew Sophie's Mount Street Band in the post parade to announce her in the post parade for the Kentucky Oaks. And I called her, written by Sophie Turner. And I, I, I didn't even realize I said that. And Randy Moss, our colleague, wrote it down. Who is Sophie Turner? I think. I said, oh my God, <laughs> I had just been reading about Sophie Turner on page six in the New York Post that morning, <laughs> and she's in Game of Thrones, obviously, and I thought, oh my God. I was looking for a way to tell her I was sorry, and I didn't see her until mm -hmm. last couple weeks in Pennsylvania, and she took it pretty well. Now, had I known that you punched out a jockey, I would have been <laughs> <laughs> terribly scared you would You had to bring that up. <laughs> yes, I did wonder, I'll come to that. Yeah. I did wonder why, uh, why Sophie got such a glowing review for her ride on our, well, our, on our ride. parks broadcast. I wasn't sucking up. It was <laughs> I mean, a good ride. Thank you. Um, now, Jer Jerry's brought this up, so I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to follow it up. Okay. You did thump one of your fellow riders. Um, just just, give, just fill, fill me in on, on exactly how that happened. Um, well, as you know, I always say, well, as I always say, I think jockeys were not normal. We all have that bit of aggression, a bit of fight in us. And, but we can also finesse ourselves and be very proper and do what's always right and let's win races. Um, but unfortunately, this one day, it was a jockey that had, he dropped me at Indiana. And it was actually a pretty nasty fall and I had, Kieran Fallon was in the race. He was out the back door. He watched everything happen. And when he watched me falling off, he pulled his horse up beside me to check like that I was okay. And I was still laying there. Everybody came out and they thought it was absolutely horrendous because I'd actually hit the back of the pole on the back of my head. So I Ooh. almost did like a butterfly effect. So it was quite severe, but I was fortunate enough. I just suffered a very good concussion. Um, but for a very long time afterwards, I managed to hold in that anger. And every race that I came in, bumped into this jockey, he was either trying to push me in, push me out. So I thought, you know what? I don't need him anywhere near me. So I never from that day gave him an opportunity to have me tucked in the inside, push me out, never just kept him away out of my, you know, out of my reach, so to speak. And this one day then, a year later, we were racing at Keeneland and it was in the last. I was on the favorite. As we broke from the gate going into the first turn, we were going a mile and 16th. He suddenly just comes swooping out pushes into me. My filly's got first blink, right wearing blinkers for the first time, so she was a bit spooked by it. He managed to push me out 15 wide around the first turn. I'm thinking, oh my God, my trainer is gonna kill me. This is not happening. I managed to swing back in, and he's looking back over at me again, trying to come at me again. Oh my God. And I, so I smooched it out. I said, well, I've gotta go. I've gotta get some momentum going, and pulled away from him, managed to get into the field. When I pulled my horse up, I was absolutely furious because naturally the horse didn't run as good. The trainer came back and the first thing he said is, why didn't you claim foul? You know, you should have claimed foul out there. And I'm looking at him, I said, look, don't worry about it. I said, it wasn't position. If we'd have finished in the top three, I would have done, but we didn't. So don't worry, I'll take care of it. I got myself back into the jocks room and I just waited and waited and waited till he was the last one coming up the steps. So he knew he'd done wrong. And as he came up the top of the steps and he saw me, he said, oh, here we go. And I just looked at him, I said, you know, what the hell is your problem? Like, what are you doing? And as he went to answer, I just had so much anger that I just clobbed him one. And he Where did you catch him? In the eye. It was almost like a left-hand uppercut. Wow. You know, in a boxing it's almost, fashion. The, the, way, the way you're describing it, it's almost like <laughs> it might have happened before. Oh, one time, might have done. <laughs> That was the right hand this time. But you, I, guess, I guess sometimes you've just got to assert yourself. <laughs> sometimes you just do. And I think when somebody's really going for you that much and 
put you in that position that honestly, I'm not a fighter. I'm not, I'll never be the one to start it properly, but I will always be the one that finishes it. I've just got that mentality that you push me to that limit and you don't want to see the other side of me. And it's almost the same as when you're in a race and you've really got to prove yourself. Like I feel I have to, I have to prove myself every single time I go out there. And it gives you that fire to ride as hard as you can and make the right decisions. And for me on that day, that was the right decision because he just, it was like, it wasn't enough that he tried to get me in, in trouble and got, almost had me hurt, that he still a year later went out of his way to do it. And I said, I just got to put a stop to this. And luckily for him, one of my friends was actually in the jocks room, a trainer called Will Van Meter. Mm -hmm. And he came down the stairs and he grabbed him and he put him up against the wall and said, you know, that's enough. He said, you know, you deserved every bit of that. We watched what you done and that was really wrong. So he kind of sent him on his merry way and said, all right, so calm down. You can go back in your room now and chill out. Um, it's just one of those things that happens. And it's not about being a male or a female. It was we're both jockeys and we're both out there to do our job. And, you know, to be honest, it doesn't make either one of us look good out there. You know, you should never take anything out on the racetrack that you've got owners and trainers and other people's horses to think about. And it was just totally unprofessional by that person. Who is no longer riding. No, he is not. So I think definitely karma had a great effect. Well. Sounds reasonable to me. I, 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 th I thought you were going to say that. I had a funny thing. Yeah. You know, you said earlier, of course, that your biggest regret in your career was getting beaten in the Pacific Classic on cigar. It's not anymore, is it? It's calling Sophie Doyle, <laughs> Sophie <laughs> Turner. Yeah, you, can, you claw, claw your way back. Just on that, on that Parks ride, though, and I know I was half yeah. joking yeah. about it, it was a cool ride. It, it was, was a smart great. ride, a cool ride. Because it, the Philly typically is not that far back. Mm -hmm. And we could see maybe there was going to be a hot pace. And it really developed. And she just let her settle way, way back. And it, I think it made the difference. Mm. And you, and I know the importance here of, of having having the clock in your head and understand, understanding the pace they're going. And you guys, when you talk about it, always make it sound incredibly straightforward because you're so used to it and it's instinctive. But you called right before the race we were working together and you said, these are the fractions that mean that Street Bank could get involved here if she's happen. ridden judiciously. And those were exactly 46 for the, for the half. And you called it spot on. You but said she's in the right Here's what place. a lot of people don't understand. In a big moment, in a big race, you know your horse, and you know typically how they run and where they're placed during races. And all of a sudden, you're either much closer or much farther back than normal. And the idea is not to panic, because a lot of times you'll try and adjust so that you're right where you're supposed to be. But the reason she's so far back is because it was so fast, or you're so close up is because it's so mm -hmm. slow, and you just have to trust what's happening and realize it and let it happen. And she did a great job. I and mean, a lot of times the best thing to do is just let the horse be. Yeah, and ride the horse to conserve, conserve energy, I guess. Yeah, I mean, conserve look, natural look at, if you're having to force a horse into the race that early just to keep it up to where you think you should be, it's usually the wrong thing. Because I know, we I know here you talk more about, especially riding on the dirt, you talk more about early speed and, and what have you. But even if, you're, even if you're using your horse, I'm guessing you want, you want that horse to be relaxed and in a rhythm. You don't want to be going faster than the horse can ought to naturally be running. Absolutely. And that's one of the key, moment, key things I've always talked about at Street Band is getting her to relax that first quarter, three-eighths of the mile. That if I can always get her relaxed at that point, I know she can show what she's got at the end. She'll have that freshness to go away and run to her ability. Um, my preparation going into the Cortillion was I had to know every single horse. I needed to know all their running styles. I'd watched previous replays on them. I've already ridden against Serengeti multiple times. Mm -hmm. um, had to be aware of Bellafina wearing blinkers first time. And of course, Garana. Who's been, who was undefeated at the time, and you knew that she was the horse to beat. Um, one thing that I've been cool about is doing that, is doing my research, knowing my form, knowing every single horse. It's almost like I've ridden every horse in the race, so I should know where all these horses yeah. are going to position themselves, and that really helps you to set up what goes on further into the race, that I can sit back, take a breath, and really evaluate where every single horse is in the race who's traveling great, who's starting to come back, which horse is kind of looking like he's starting to tie, but you know he's still got another few gears to go through. You don't want to be too far off of them. And also, keep going, 
at parks was, do you go down the inside or do you come around the outside? And I've been told by so many people, do not go near the fence, just stay out. And it was when Edgar Prado messaged me and he said, look, just stay wide. You stay wide and you've got a chance to win. So I really just, I took that on board and when I was coming around the final turn, it was almost like in my mind I was listening. Okay, just trust everybody yeah. and trust Street Band. I knew that she had it in her and when and we did just that and when we turned in the stretch, it was, you know, the right horses were there in front of me that I thought they would be. So I said, well, we've got one horse here to beat, let's go for it and she took me. Preparation is everything. You're sitting next to the right, right man. That was, that was really your mantra, wasn't it? Be sure. better prepared than everybody else. Yeah, I, I didn't think I was as physically gifted as some of the guys I rode against, Angel and Lafitte and those guys. In fact, I knew I wasn't. So I had to figure out another way to be on equal terms with them or better than them, and that was preparation. And to know every horse, the details about every rider, not only the horse's propensities, but what the riders do. Because horses will run the way that we want them to run. Riders will typically get into patterns, like, like George Chavez, just mm. to, not, not to pick on George, but the only thing he liked better than moving at the 5-8 pole was moving at the 3-quarter pole. <laughs> so you could almost always count on him moving early, and you didn't want to be positioned in front of him because he would force you to move early. So it's just little things like that. And I, I, you, you've carried that on because I remember the first time I worked with you all those years ago when you, you'd only just retired. Um, we were working for ESPN. I couldn't believe it because I'd worked with all these jockeys at home and they were great on TV, but they just sort of came in and sort of said some stuff. And then that, but I walked in and there you were sitting, sitting at a desk doing all this research. I'm like, my God, a, an ex-jockey who's doing all, the, all, all this prep. Um, it was, you know, it was brilliant. I, I couldn't believe it. But it was, it, obviously, I, I'm massively uh, admiring of that because it's not the, the ethic that most people have. That was my routine. Yeah. So that's why it was a big transition from me to being in the saddle to be on TV. But it's scary to walk in the jocks room even now, and you'll see a big percentage of the riders don't even have a racing form in their locker open. Uh, it's kind of frightening. A lot of guys will subscribe to the theory, I ride the race the way it comes up. You know, Well, that's fine. But you also have to have a basis of, of education and know what horses do what, I think. Uh, if you're that good, you're that good. But I think that you know, most people think you were that good as well as being that well prepared. Um, Jerry, thank you so much. Um, I have to put up with me for this weekend and a few more weekends to come. <laughs> it's always fun. Uh, Sophie, thank you very much. Uh, Jerry Bailey and Sophie Doyle. You've been watching Luck at the Cup. <laughs>